Okay, let's get started. In this video lecture, we are going to consider a topic known as the Grubbs test. The Grubbs test is a topic of, of reasonable importance. You should definitely pay attention to this. I, I would rate it a importance of three and a half out of four stars. And I would say you're likely to encounter a problem like this either on a semester exam or on your standardized final. Um, you might have a Grubbs test problem, you might have a related uh, type of problem called a Q-test, uh, but it's very common to actually see this type of problem uh, um, on standardized exams. The good news is it's relatively simple to figure out how to use this test, but before we do that, let's talk about what this test is actually used for. The Grubbs test is a quantitative test used to determine whether or not a strange data point can be considered an outlier. So this is basically used when you do an experiment, uh, multiple replicates of an experiment, say five, six trials, and you end up with one data point, which really seems kind of strange. It, its value is very far from the others. Maybe it's high, maybe it's low, it, it doesn't matter. But you suspect that something really went wrong in that particular analysis. That weird data point might be referred to as an outlier. Okay, basically it's a data point that we can be statistically confident does not belong to the, the true distribution of data. And if that data point is an outlier and something just went wrong in the analysis, it's a gross error, we want to be able to throw that out of our data pool and not use it in our analysis because we're very, very confident that it's just not correct. and It doesn't make sense to use incorrect data. So the Grubbs test is a way that we can prove that data point is in fact an outlier quantitatively. It's a quantitative test. It's not just guessing. So how does this work? What we're going to do is use an equation to compute something called G calc. It's a calculated G value. It's pretty easy to calculate G because all you need is this equation. What it is, is you take the absolute value of the difference between the odd strange value, the possible outlier, and the X sub bar, which is the mean of the data set. So the possible outlier minus the mean, take the absolute value of that so it's not a negative number. And then you're going to divide that by the standard deviation of our data sets. It's important to realize that when you do this calculation, when you're computing the mean and the standard deviation, you do include the possible outlier in the computation. Okay, So that is included when you're computing the mean and the standard deviation. That's a point of confusion but you do want to include it. Okay. After you're done computing gcalc, the next step is to compare gcalc with a tabular value of g. We'll get this in a data table. The data table will not need to be memorized, but you will not need to know how to use the data table. If gcalc is larger than the tabular value, the data point is an outlier and we're able to reject it from our data pool. We're able to throw it out, that means, and not consider it when we report our results. So we can go back and perform statistics without the outlier if it is in fact proven to be an outlier. However, if the calculated G is lower than the tabular value, the data point is not an outlier. And we should include it in our data pool and not throw it out. Because it's possible that that data point is in fact a member of that population. All right. So let's take a look at how this type of test would actually be used in the form of a sample problem. I just made this up, but it gives you an uh, idea for the spirit of these types of problems. Replicate analysis is conducted on a sample of pet food with results as follows. So in this analysis, they were measuring calcium. Okay, and I just made these numbers up. They're not necessarily representative of a, tr a real sample, just to give you an idea for what one of these problems would look like. But it looks like the analyst has done four trials, trial one through four, and each time got slightly different results, as you would expect, okay? There's random error, sometimes high, sometimes low. First trial, 173 milligrams per liter, 196, 181, and then finally 247. Now, as I look at this data, it seems like 247 is kind of the oddball. That's the one that might possibly be the outlier. And in fact, we're asked directly, is the data point at 247 parts per million an outlier? 
that sets up the problem nicely because we can easily test that. If you weren't asked and you're just, if I just said, okay, is that is an outlier present in this data set? You basically just want to look for the point that's furthest from the others. It might be high, it might be low, in this case it's high, but you want to look for that strange, weird possible outlying point, okay? So once we determine which one that is, we can start on our grubs test. When we're doing that, our strategy is always to first find x sub r and s. The reason for that is, of course, very, very obvious. Because if we look at the form of the equation for g calc, we need to plug those values directly into the equation. So we need to know what the x bar and the s actually is. It's always our first step when we're doing our Grubbs test. Now again, there are other videos for computing x sub bar and s. I'll let you review those to find how to compute the mean and the standard deviation if you're struggling with that. And in the interest of time, I went ahead and did this in advance. And if I compute my mean, I get 199.25 milligrams per liter with a standard deviation of a little over 33 milligrams per liter. Okay, So those are the values I can use here. I just computed that up for that data set. Again, when you're computing the X bar and the S for use with the Grubbs test, you want to use all of the data available to you in the pool. That includes the possible outlier. So these numbers include this value. Okay, That's important to keep in mind. You don't want to get yourself confused. Now once I compute that mean and standard deviation, I am on to the next step in my analysis. And of course that next step is the computation of G count because I'm going to need to compare that with my table value. If you remember the form of the equation, we want to take the absolute value. I'll show that to you again, just in case you forgot. Of the strange value minus the mean, the possible outlier minus the mean. Now, in this particular data set, our possible outlying point was registered at 247. And the mean of our data set was 199.25. So possible outlier minus the mean. Recall, I need to divide that result by S, which was our standard deviation. Our standard deviation was 33.23. This result will also carry the units of milligrams per liter, so they end up canceling out. And our final result for G calc is unitless. If I do the math on this, I end up with a value for G calc of 1.436. Okay, so let's just calculate our work. I'll assume that you figured that out. But this is my G calc. I've now completed G calc. I need to go on to the second step of my analysis. I'm not done yet. And of course the second step, called it step two, is always to compare G calc with what I'll call G cable, the tabular value of G. Now, as with many of these statistical tests, you will be given a data table to use. You don't have to memorize this data table. On your exam, it's going to be provided. If you're taking a standardized exam, it's usually on the inside cover, perhaps the back cover, depending on the printing. But you should be able to quickly uh, look this type of table up and use it. This is an example table for a Grubbs test. And you see it's just two columns of data. It's pretty easy to understand. The first column has number of observations. The second column is G. This, of course, is G table, your reference value. This particular column is at 95% confidence. I wanted to point out that 95% confidence is not always used. Maybe you use 90% confidence or 99, 99.5% confidence. It can vary, okay? So you might have multiple columns of data. This one only, this particular example table only has one at 95% confidence. And that's, of course, how confident we are that the value will be an outlier
and we can reject it ultimately. Okay, but if there's multiple columns, don't be confused by that. It might be that there's just different levels of confidence for G, the G, G table value. Another thing I want you to pay attention to in these charts, this particular chart is given a number of observations. Sometimes I've seen these charts in terms of number of degrees of freedom, DOF degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom for your analysis here is n minus 1, where n is the number of points in your data pool. So in this particular example problem, we had four points. So the number of degrees of freedom would be n minus 1 or, or 3. Okay? If this particular column was written in degrees of freedom, you'd have to know this to find the correct value. Okay, now here it's easier because it's just number of observations and, and that's four. So this first number is going to be the one that's relevant to us in this particular sample problem because we have four observations. And as a result, G table is equal to 1.463. Okay? Of course, I just got that directly off uh, my table here. All right, so we're making progress. We can now directly compare G calculated with G table. And what do we find? Well, it looks to me that G table is a little bit bigger than our calculated G. So again, if you're doing a free response type question on an exam, you want to write out this type of statement and then take it one step further and write out what this means. Okay. What does this mean? Well, if you're confused, we can look back to an earlier set of notes about the G-test here, what the relevance of which one is bigger is. And we said that if G-calc is less than G-table, which is what we've got here, G-table is bigger, the data is not an outlier. So therefore, the point at 247 is not an outlier and we should not reject it from our data pool. So even though that point seemed strange, it seemed like it didn't belong, our Grubbs test showed that it might be a member of this population. Okay, And just due to random sampling error, we're quite a bit higher than the other ones. So we should not throw this out. If GCALC was, say, 1.57, then it would have been okay to throw it out because then it would have been bigger. But here it's smaller, so we can't throw it out. Have to include it when we report our data uh, to our boss or whoever uh, we need to make our report for. Okay? All right, so this is an example of the Grubbs test for detection of an outlying data point. Again, I would rank this in importance three and a half out of four stars. There's a pretty good possibility you might see this on an exam. Thank you.